good afternoon good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome once again to our fatherland group and our events where we have conversations pertaining to nigeria so our next um item next item on our on our agenda is of course um this video is it's it's going to just set the the the, the place the room the stage for the conversation this afternoon um and it's been we are of course we must give credit to whom credit is due. We appreciate, um, because it is courtesy of Ed Kiazo, um, that we have this video and it is titled um, January 15th, 1970, Untold Memories of the Nigeria Biafra War. Um, it's going to be very interesting. It's just um, excerpts from that docu the documentary. Um, so we're going to just watch that for a moment and it will set the stage for the conversation that we're about to have. Thank you all so much for your attention. 7th April 1970. The government announces a deadline for exchange of defunct Nigerian currencies held by those in the war zone, on condition that the accounts had not been operated since 30th of May 1967. The government also announces the payment of an ex gratia sum of £20 to all those who emerge from Biafra. At the end of the war, the whole lot, whether you're a billionaire, a millionaire, thousandaire, we all received equal amount of money, 20 pounds. And it was this 20 pounds that rooted all these things we are now seeing, because it was a dynamic. Shakespeare said that all is fair in love and war. And so the policies which the federal government used against Biafra or Biafrans is a natural consequence of war. Um, you can criticize this and I criticize this, but they also have their, that side also have their own justifications because you know that Biafra had printed their own currency throughout the war. So uh, the rules were very technical about the 20 pounds. Any amount you have will change for 20 pounds, Nigerian pounds then. If you have an account which you have not operated, you get the full account to you, you get it back. Uh, so it has its, the policy in its implementation had some hard hardships. Um, so a lot of Biafrans, uh, Nigerians who uh, came from Biafra, were um, had rough, rough, had the rough end of the implementation. The River State Abandoned Property Custody and Management Edict Number no. Eight of 1969 was enacted shortly after the capture of Port Harcourt by the government of Lieutenant Commander Dieter Spiff. It assumed custody of properties abandoned by owners who had fled during the war. While there were similar laws in other states, it was only in River State that the majority of the owners were not reinstated into their properties post-war. The irony was that properties abandoned by Igbos in the North were rigorously held in trust by the state governments, with the crude rents retained and rendered to the owners upon their return. Likewise in Western and Lagos states. A lot of riverine people, not necessarily the Igbos there, the Quires, were, were in support of the federal government the way to to re retrieve themselves from the control of the Igbos and so as the war ended many of the riverine particularly riverine people saw all the developments all the properties as their their uh, their, <laughs> what is it? their well in the bible even when you go, to, when the Israelites or anybody goes to somewhere, everything you do is, is spoils of war. They consider it this is their their bad time to inherit all these houses. So that uh, policy was put in place. It wasn't put in place only in rivers, but it was applied differently in rivers. Lagos had the same, Kaduna had the same, but they were not applied in the same way. It was often to protect the properties against. 
uh, third party who will take it over. In rivers, it was inheritance. This was the background to the life that faced Musibus after three years of brutal war and strife. Many succumbed to grief after the war. Thank you so much. As I said earlier, it sets the stage for the conversation that we're about to have today. Um, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to hear. Um, Nigeria, each time we have our conversations regarding the country, doesn't matter which aspect you take it from, there's always a lesson to be learned. There's always a new thing to be heard. Our history and our culture is so rich um, that, you know, you think you've heard it all, but there's always something that you are yet to hear. And it never ceases to amaze me. Okay, so get ready. Um, we're going to hear from our very first commentator and the man himself that, you know, what should we call him? The walking encyclopedia of Nigeria. Um, <laughs> he's a corporate lawyer, a historian, and an author of several books concerning Nigeria, including the history of the country titled A Fatherless People, the secret story of how the Nigerians missed the road to the promised land. Wow. He is the founder of the Fatherland Group and the chairman of the Yoruba Foundation, a member of the Society of Authors. He is also a regular commentator on Nigerian affairs on TV, radio, and in print. So let me not take any more of his time. Let us put our hands together as we welcome. He is the legend, you know, you may or may not agree, but I think he is when it comes to Nigerian issues. Let's welcome the man himself, Mr. Dele Ogun. Uh, Priscilla, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for that introduction. And thank all the acts uh, that have performed so far uh, and those who have spoken uh, before me. I'm particularly grateful that they've all left me so much time that we're running ahead of schedule uh, such that I look at the program and I see that my uh, uh, contribution is supposed to end at half past five uh, and I'm not one to... Um, look a gift horse in the mouth. So I want to thank you all uh, for uh, handing over the extra time to me because I, as you might imagine, I've got a lot to say. Uh, this is the Yoruba and Igbo speaking with one voice conference. This is the second uh, in the series. Uh, we were here last year with the academics, uh, Professor uh, Akintoye and uh, Professor uh, Nwanze uh, led the act uh, on that occasion. And this time around, uh, we've turned to our footballers, our legends, and you'll be hearing from both of them uh, uh, later on. And the theme, as uh, Priscilla has explained to us, is the brotherly rivalry. Because we are brothers, and there is a rivalry, and we're not going to shy away from that. The whole object of the fatherland mission is for us to deal with facts. We're not here to try and distort or change the facts. The facts will speak for themselves. And even if you hide them for a while, they will emerge further down the road. What we're here to do is to change the narrative. Because it's the narrative that shapes the understanding. And there have been distortions in the narrative. And it's that that we are on course to straighten out. Now, one thing I love about our gatherings is that there's no shortage of questions and hard questions for us to deal with. And already I've looked at the Q&A box and uh, open spaces compliance consultants, whoever they may be, I would have preferred that we knew whether they're Igbo or Yoruba or indeed the House of Lani that are asking these questions, but we allowed them to stay behind the screen as open spaces compliance consultants. And they've asked a question. What do we mean by Yoruba and Igbo speaking with one voice? One voice on what? Should the, and the second question is, should the objective rather than speaking with one voice, be seeking mutual understanding, as speaking with one voice might be close to impossible. Well, what a better way to kick off me dealing with a difficult question. But the answer is easy. The answer to the first part, why speaking with one voice? 
is this. It's actually rooted in the narrative that's in the program where I've set out the history of the relationship. Because there was a time when Ibos and Yoruba spoke with one voice. That is when we were just known as Southern Nigerians. There was a Southern Nigeria. That is a reality. And as I say, we're not here to change these facts, but to understand them and incorporate them in our understanding of the present and in guiding us on a future path. So the question then arises, if there was that one voice of Southern Nigeria, how did it become fragmented, fractured, such that it got to the point that we were spitting fire and fury, Igbos against Yorubas, Yorubas against Igbos. How did that happen? And again, in the, your program material that we've pushed out, you will see the explanation. This is a rivalry that can be traced to a particular date, April Fool's Day, 1939. We were made fools of, and we've been playing the fool, some of us willingly, some of us inadvertently because we're ignorant of the facts. And so the whole object of the fatherland mission is to bring that understanding, to shine the light on these dark spaces where mistrust and distrust uh, will thrive and flourish. Then it's not just me saying that this rivalry is artificial. In the program, you see that the front of the program we have is all about legends. Both nations produce legends. We're gonna hear from the football legends later. But before the football legends, there were the political legends. Ujuku on the one hand, our law on the other hand. Rivals, by virtue of that fractured relationship. So as I said, it wasn't just, it's not just me saying that the rivalry is artificial. Let's look at the quotation that we've got in the program from Ujuku. He said, I'm humbly of the opinion that the true beginnings of our loss of direction as a nation. So there he's referring to Nigeria. Can be traced directly to the fabrication. Let that word sink in. Fabrication. And installation of what I had earlier called East-West dichotomy. Fabrication and installation of the East-West dichotomy. Where they were speaking with one voice from the point of the creation of Southern Nigeria in 1906. That was the first amalgamation before the 1914 amalgamation. They were speaking with one voice. And then 1st of April, 1939, <clears throat> without invitation from either East or West, because those concepts did not exist, without application from either the Igbos or the Yoruba, and without consultation with our political leaders, Governor Bodilo now decreed that henceforth there'll be Eastern region and Western region. So that is the date on which the voice was splintered, the voice that we're trying to bring back together again to speak in harmony. If you're looking for the source of that quotation from Ojuku, you'll find it in his book, Because I Am Involved. It's a fantastic book. But he wasn't alone. You see, great minds, they think alike. And what did Aulawa have to say? He said, 
I hold it as a fact that if the action group and the NCNC, for the benefit of those who might not know Nigerian history, the action group was essentially the political vehicle, the political party of the Western region, predominantly Yoruba, and the NCNC was the political machinery of the Eastern region, led by Namdi Azikiwe. He said, I hold it as a fact that if the action group and the NCNC, both of which parties have a monopoly of political following in the South, and at least one third of the political followership in the North could come together, and I'll insert and speak with one voice, then they would infinitely increase the tempo of progress in the Federation as a whole. So the object of the speaking with one voice, coming together to speak with one voice, as he saw it, I will always saw it, was for the benefit of Nigeria as a whole. You'll find that quote in his book, The Trial of Obafemi Aulo. In actual fact, it's much more of, a, it was written by somebody else whose name escapes me uh, for the moment. It wasn't actually authored by Aulo himself. Uh, but that was him being quoted. So as I said, the, the, the answer to the question, what do we mean by Yoruba and Igbo speaking with one voice? That's what we mean. Repairing the broken relationship. Speaking in the interests of what was Southern Nigeria for the benefit of all Nigerians. Because an imbalance of power is never a good thing. It's not just nature that loves equilibrium. Good governance requires equilibrium and balance. And the second question is, should the objective rather than speaking with one voice be seeking mutual understanding? As speaking with one voice might be close to impossible. Well, clearly, Fatherland's mission is to, by dealing with these thorny issues, to improve understanding with a view to securing mutual understanding. Because the criminal act of 1st of April 1939, the deliberate knocking of heads together didn't just stop there. If you look at that program that we've sent out, you see the actions that perpetuated uh, that rivalry. Sometimes the main actors themselves did not know that they were being played. And that takes me to that video that um, we just listened to. The thorny issue of the war of the policies that were used in the persecution and the prosecution of that war, the blockade, the starvation, and the change of currency, the 20 pound policy. We cannot run away from these issues. These are realities. All we can seek to do is to understand and put them in the context to which they belong. <clears throat> now, it must be remembered, and it's often lost sight of, and I hear I speak in defense of my idol, Abafemi Aulo, that he was a member of that administration but he was not the leader of the administration. And sometimes I hear commentary suggesting that our lower decided to pursue a starvation policy. Well, how can you do that when you're not the leader of the administration, especially a military government? You're a member of the administration. 
you have your portfolio. <clears throat> and there's no dispute that it's on record that he defended the starvation policy and said it's uh, an instrument of war and that one is not there to feed one's uh, opponents. That is a reality. But to suggest that he implemented a policy, let alone initiated it, uh, that is part of the poison narrative uh, that we have uh, to deal with. Similarly, <clears throat> the suggestion that he, our Lord, uh, decided on the policy or initiated the policy whereby at the end of the war, Ibo's received 20 pounds in exchange for whatever bank balances they had prior to the war. We heard the detail in that video. Now, it was an issue that troubled me for a long while. But the joy of history is that it's never static. There's always new learning and there's always new evidence bubbling up such that we can understand uh, what happened. And I came across a book and often the answers to these riddles are not to be found on the ground, but are to be found uh, elsewhere. I came across a book and I would highly recommend it, a book titled Aftermath. And subtitled Life in the Fallout of the Third Reich. This is the fall of Nazi Germany. And there was a chapter titled The Economic Miracle. Currency Reform, the second hour. And this section talks about a, a DJ who was, a, he was in charge of a popular radio station in Northern Germany. And on an occasion, two British military policemen appeared. DJ Howland was uneasy, but the appearance of the policemen in their red uniforms seldom boded well, but they just pressed an envelope into his hand and told him to read out the contents at 6.30 the next morning, when he started the day again with the early show, Wakey Wakey. When morning came, Chris Howland opened the envelope and as he had been ordered to do, he read, the first law of the reform of the German currency promulgated by the military governments of Great Britain, the United States and France will go into effect on the June the 20th. The old German currency is hereby invalidated. The new currency will be the Deutschmark, which will be divided into 100 Dutch pfennigs. The old money, the Reichsmark, the Rentenmark and Mark notes issued in Germany by the Allied military authorities will become invalid on June the 21st. And the text goes on to say that the Germans had been waiting for months for this moment. There had been a lot of talk about a currency devaluation. No one trusted the Reichmark anymore and everyone who still had enough swapped them for tangible goods. Apart from the millions who were starving, there were any number of Germans who had more right marks than they could spend and who led a life of, of officially illegal luxury purchased at astronomic prices. Doubts about the right mark 
meant the traders had held back more and more goods, holding for the day when they would be a stable currency with better prices in the future. In the early summer of 1948, the shops were very nearly empty because rumors about the coming D-Day were constantly spreading. Now the time had come. Throughout the day, listeners to BFN as a radio station would learn more about the procedure. Everyone would receive an allowance of 40 Dutchmarks, which they could collect on Sunday, the 20th of July, at the ration card issuing offices in exchange for 60 Reichmarks. A month later, they would receive an additional 20 Dutchmarks in exchange for the same number of Reichmarks. And here's the punch. Any Reichmarks beyond the first 60 would be practically worthless. 1,000 Reichmarks would have a value of 65 Deutschmarks. In this way, about 93% of the old Reichmark supply was destroyed without replacement. Savers were left with only 6.5% of their assets. Now I share that story such that we begin to understand the wider context of the Biafra war and the policies that were applied in the course of that conflict. So that we don't look at these issues from too narrow a perspective. Where did these lessons come from? This change of currency policy. Now we see it, it had been done in Berlin by the allied powers and allied forces. So much of our history, the explanation for it, for the broken voices and the splintered tongues is often to be found outside of ourselves. That doesn't change the facts of what happened, but it should help us as we seek to understand the role of the different actors. Now, I noticed that there are a few more questions there on the Q&A. Let me just check if they're appropriate for me to deal with. Uh, Yeah, we'll, we'll deal with them. We'll deal with them later on in the course of the discussion. Um, because I don't want to, even though I have friends to use up all the time, uh, I don't want to monopolize it because I know Tim, my brother, uh, from across the river, uh, across the river, Niger, will be very grateful uh, to use some of the time uh, as well. But let me end my contribution at this point here by saying and sharing with you. I might be passionate about the politics of Africa and the politics of Nigeria and the politics of Igbo Yoruba relations. And as the chairman of the Yoruba Foundation, passionate about the future of the Yoruba nation. But there's possibly one passion that exceeds all of that. And it's the passion for football. That is what gets me going. Those who really know me. And um, such that I'm so looking forward to when we can lighten the discussion later on and talk football. Because that's when you get me smiling more than when you're talking about these political leaders. Uh, in Nigeria. So at this point, uh, let me hand back to our beautiful compare, uh, Priscilla uh, Inwiko. Thank you, Priscilla.
So let me um, just move on quickly. Our next commentator is the son of Timothy C. Mordu himself, who was a chief negotiator for the Biafran government during the war. He has a deep rooted interest and practice experience in conflict resolution and community relations. He is a social entrepreneur with more than 30 years practice experience and a passion in promoting and protecting community interest in sustainable development across the UK and Nigeria. He is a chartered manager by profession, studied public policy and management at the University of London and also has qualifications in business in business and management from UEL Business School, as well as an um, earlier chartered certificate in accountancy studies. He is a member of the Chatham House and is currently exploring his father's legacy before, during and after the Biafran War. Amongst other high level public policy and management work in the UK, he has advised numerous, numerous public sector bodies in Nigeria also. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, can we put our hands together and welcome Mr. Timothy Morden Jr. You are most welcome, sir. It's always an opportunity um, when we have conferences like this, it's often neglected where we're coming from. Um, as you all know, we're all Fatherland group members. And I, I thought, don't say any other word without having the opportunity to give a shout to my fellow colleagues at the Fatherland group. Uh, the brain box group I call the brain box of the future uh, the future of the nations of Nigeria. Uh, you, you, you are always um, amazed where what that group have to offer every time you go in there and I encourage people if you have not already joined Fatherland group it's one of those groups it's not easy to get in but make an attempt to join so it's for me um, a very important group so I thought to give a shout to my fellow colleagues at Fatherland group but um, for uh, so I would like to uh, for this conference to speak briefly um, about um, my what I see as a very passionate area, uh, football, particularly the Enugu Rangers, not just football, the Enugu Rangers, there's something special about my relationship with the Enugu Rangers, and, and you will come to know uh, pretty soon. Um, for me, uh, the story of Enugu Rangers um, cannot be told without reference to the Biafran War and its aftermath to the lives of ordinary people of Ndibo, old and young, rich and poor. For Ndibo, these are people defeated in a battle, but not in a war. A people down, but not out. A people that never die, say die and always, mm -hmm. always endeavors and gives their very best, no matter what the challenge facing them. A people that have it in it, in their DNA, almost an inbuilt resilience to always bounce back, uh, no matter what the level of adversity and challenge facing them. The story of Enugu Rangers Football Club and all Igbo Club formed in 1970, immediately after the end of the Biafran War, represent a simply an epitome of that unique character of Ndiwo. By 1980, 10 years after they formed, this all Igbo clubs had become a household name um, in not just Igbo land, but in Nigeria and to a large extent um, in Africa. In 10 years period, the Nugu Rangers International won all the major trophies in Nigeria three times over. Is it a league? Is it a challenge cup? And in so many respects, most of the, they were all in competitions uh, the football competition, club level competitions in most in, in Africa, all African club co competitions. So you think of 10 years after the war ended, 
only 10 years of people dejected, forgotten. A group of young people came in and looked aside. They had nothing else left for them but to take the mantle and take on and form the whole new football club that went in and showed what the Ibers are made of. Now, that is the epitome of the Ernie Rangers for you. Now, in my, um, uh, like I said, my connection with this club um, goes deep. Um, one of my, uh, you know, in secondary school in Nigeria, you will always have a master uh, as when you join in. So one of my uh, masters became a legendary player for Enugu Rangers. So you could imagine that when I talked about Enugu Rangers, I couldn't but resist the fact that my master, okay, Sima, a young man, a midfielder, mm -hmm. who came in as young person, knowing the mantle, joined this club and never, like any of them, let Igbo people down or the club down. And he made it all the way to become part of the team, not just winning in the Nugu Rangers, but selected to play for the Nigerian Green Eagles, now called the Super Eagles. If you look at that team, especially the 1980 team, that is the hallmark of the history of Nigeria, where you have a squad of the Nigerian team, the African Cup of Nations was hosted in Nigeria in 1980. That squad was full, dominated by uh, Enugu Rangers, about five, four or five players of Enugu Rangers, first team, and four or five players of IICC shooting stars of Ibadan. And the two characters and the two legends uh, that we'll speak today, uh, later on this evening, represented the hallmark of the evil by Chief Okala, uh, Indigo, and uh, Shigun Odebami, the mathematical, the Chief Odebami, mathematical Odebami, who was just a mesmerizing, that name mathematical was just a mesmerizing thing. But these two clubs, uh, in the Rangers by 1980, and my, my master, who was part of in the Rangers, became part of that team, that won for Nigeria to win the first Africa Cup of Nations. We are playing African Cup of Nations now. Everybody's praying for Nigeria to win. But you have to remember that 1980 was their first win of that trophy. And my master, um, unfortunately now late, he died in 2013. And who, kindly enough, his younger brother, another brilliant footballer, Ndubisi Sima, a member of our fatherland group is here, and I'm grateful to see that. Now, OK was part of that group, and we won at the Nigerian War, won the first Africa Cup of Nations. Okala, of course, was in goal. So my hope today is that we'll tease out um, a bit of that side of Okala's uh, his experience uh, with him and Shegun Odegwami being rivalries in the Rangers and ICC shooting stars. To give you an idea of what Rangers meant for us and Okala, for example, if you were a young person in school and you're a goalkeeper and you're doing well, automatically your name is Okala in the goal. That's how brilliant every young person you want to be Okala. The same, uh, we have players like Christian Chuku, you know, Aloshi Satoebu, all of them. Every Igbo person, they represented not just in football, but when you go out to do business immediately after the war, you think of Enugu Rangers, you say you must succeed like the Enugu Rangers. Everything that people did in Igbo land, Enugu Rangers just gave everybody the will and the power to, for you to believe that you can do it. You can do it. In 10 years, this club was just phenomenal. And um, when this subject came, I just said, please, guys, hold me back because my passion for Inugu Rangers, you have to contain it. And in particular, the IICC shooting star. I just can't wait to see what happens afterwards. But the key message, in all honesty, that this, this is what the conference is. There are a couple of messages that's coming, you know, to fruition. That, that's why I like 
fatherland conferences. They are so timely, so apt, you know, the choosing of this subject matter, uh, talking about the brotherly, you know, rival between the Nugu Ranges and the IICC Shooting Stars of Ibadan, which represented the Yoruba club and the Nugu Ranges representing the evil club. The, the relationship that even though we were, they were rivalries, winning competitions, yet each, each of the individual players that played, even at that peak, go look at their relationships. They were almost like indivisible twos. Like Okala told me, is when I mentioned Shegun Degbami, he said something like, you know, Shegun is one of my best friends. I'm thinking, really? Really? You guys were like a club that's, you know, everybody have to take position. And Okala said to me, Shegun is like my best mate. I almost every other, every other week, I speak to him till this day. This is about 40 years relationship. And it made me to realize that we in the fatherland group and people out there, there are models of best practice of history of good relationship between Yoruba and Iwos. Wherever you go, our job and responsibility is to go search it out, dig it out, and showcase it because there are histories of best practice of these two nations working together as brothers and sisters. Yes, we have healthy competition and healthy rivalries, but my God, they, after that, they still stay longer and maintain that close relationship. And our job is to showcase as many of it as possible. I've heard Dele once say, that the focus, the facts are not our problems. The facts will always be there. It is a narrative story that we have to change. And by showcasing the story of Shegun Odegbami and of uh, ICC Shooting Stars and the Nugu Rangers uh, in Mokala, today is an example and epitome of best practice that we must continue to showcase every opportunity and the more we do it the more we will be able to show that truly and truly Yoruba and Igbo can speak in one voice and together we can make a change and thank you all thank you thank you so much for that thank you so much for that sir team that was excellent right just uh, I could start with a couple of the uh, the last question the Chima's one and uh, Allows one. There is some uh, correlation, and, and I can pick up on. I will leave the owl story and the political side of it. Delay it's, uh, it's well advanced on it, and his uh, his um, chronology of events. Um, if um, the people can go back to it, it would actually solve quite a lot of problems. But um, the the issue about the the brother uh, the the brotherly rivalry uh, transcending that's part of the essence of this conference. One of the things that we realized um, um, that could easily be missed is that, um, and that's why it's important, um, Okala have assured me that he will use his best endeavors to be here to, so that we can hear from him from the horse's mouth to say to you, actually, the more people like Okala and Shegun will come, to speak to us, because I can tell you now, some of the even the rivalries may have been caused by the IICC shooting stars and the Nugu Rangers of our generation that haven't been resolved. We never knew that these guys are actually helping each other. So you, Okala and uh, Shagun coming now and telling us, look guys, we are mates. We've been mates for 40 years. It's one of the healing process because I can tell you now, whatever that percentage of relationship, some of them who, you know, people of our generation, we were very young. We just think, simply took position. We never sort of understood the Zeke and our history in 1960 or 15 before independence. All we saw was Rangers and IICC shooting stats. Of course, we also over time came to realize that they played for the Eagles. Like people are taking it lightly now, what's happening in the Nigerian squad. Every time you look at, and this is what I'm saying to Chima, People like, if you look at current Nigerian squad, 
it is still dominated by the brothers of Enugu Rangers and the um, the the Igbos and the Yorubas are still the primary brotherly. And you can't go to a match and win just every and just the last few games they've played. They won all their matches. You can't just simply go there and win. Um, having that, th these people are actually working together. It is our responsibility to draw it out and showcase it and saying these things are not happening by accident. And that's why I like the conference today. So the more of these um, solution type thing that in the past and would draw it out as fatherland, the better. I hold my final point on this, and which is what uh, um, I think Ola Balogun referring to to some extent, is that there is no single silver bullet to solving the problem of the relationship between um, the Igbos and Yorubas. And also this conference we're making it is not exclusion of others. It is, we are looking at it and saying at the every level that there is a breakdown, you've got to understand the two people that own the conflict. In a conflict resolution situation, when there is a conflict, there will be only be two people that own it. We are aware that there are invisible hands. In a Yoruba Igbo situation, this conference is focused on that two people that own the conference, uh, own conflict, and looking at ways that we can build it back. Other relationships, is we've already done something last year uh, dealing with the Southern Nigeria as a whole, but for now, exclusively, whenever we do this particular conference, the belief is to look at that indivis indivisible level of conflict and try to find a solution to it. I'll leave the rest of the political questions uh, to Dele, my brother, to, to uh, take on. You know. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. So let me take, um, uh, and keep the questions coming. Uh, let me take the question from Joseph Oladusu. Uh, did the rivalry of Namdia and I will not precede that of Ojuku and Aoloa? If I will answer that by actually saying that there was no rivalry between Aoloa and Ojuku. They were on the other sides of the conflict, but there was no personal rivalry between them. And you could see that in the sentiments that were expressed uh, quote, as quoted in the program that we sent out both speaking the same language, both recognizing the, the dividends for Nigeria if the rivalry between the Igbos and the Yoruba could be mended, could be fixed, could be breached. Ujuku speaking in his book, because I am involved, speaking in glowing terms about our Lord, and as many people remember, it was he that referred to our law as the best president that Nigeria never had. So there was no rivalry between uh, those two. The rivalry between Azikiwe and our law was different. It wasn't even so much a personal rivalry, in my assessment. They were in two opposing political camps. Our lower was in and leading the action group, as Ikwe was leading the NCNC. And it was a tussle for power. And I always explain to people that power is one of those things that is hard to divide it. It's interesting that we're talking about football today. Power is represented by that football. The game is all about possession. If you haven't got possession of the ball, you can't really hurt your opponent. You can't advance your interests of scoring any opponent's goal until you have possession. Mm -hmm. 
like the ball, power can not be cut into two. Once you cut the ball into two, it's not a ball any longer. And so the game was set up in the Nigeria space that there was only one ball. And what had happened was that, as I explained in the chronology, which I encourage people to keep going back to, what, it, what happened was that there was one team, Southern Nigeria, 1906. They played for the same team. Then the referee in the colonial powers for their own interests and with a view to their own agenda now divided the team into two, East and West. But more than that, behind the scenes, knocking heads together, feeding information into one's head, and other information into the other side's head, such that they began to see themselves as the enemy. So that was the, the rivalry. And yes, that came before the war. Because remember, Azikiwe and Aoloa were actually wearing the same jerseys. to begin with. They were both members of the Nigeria youth movement. Both, when I read the autobiographies of both, what came through was that both were sportsmen. This is why it's good that we've got this sports theme for our event, to hang these lessons of history, to hang it on the sports theme. Zeke was an athlete. Our law was a centre forward. He wore the number nine jersey. They're my kind of people because sportsmen understand the proper limits of competition. Healthy competition, brotherly rivalry. It is the politics that then came to destabilise everything and that was the handiwork of those who, without consultation, splits southern Nigeria on April Fool's Day, 1939. So yes, the Aroloa Azikiwe, but more properly, the action group versus NCNC rivalry uh, came well before the war. But the important lesson that fatherland wishes to convey is not the fact of the rivalry because that is a fact and that's not there to be changed. But the making of that rivalry, the origins, the roots, and the way it has been sustained thereafter with what objective. And when we go back to the comments of both men, our lower Nojuk saying that if we could put this rivalry aside between the Igbos and the Yoruba, not only would it be beneficial to Igbo and Yoruba people, but it would be beneficial to all Nigerians. There'll be dividends for all. So that's the answer to Joseph's uh, question. Um, Julie, Obiamiwe asked me the question, don't you think that our lower should have resigned? There is a part of me as one who admires our lower so much, uh, wishing that he never, never got involved. But then I have to understand the context and we must have the courage to deal with it. We have to remember, and it ties into the, my immediate last remark, 
a rivalry had been created between those who were members of the same team previously. They were both members, Aolo and Azikwe, both wore the jersey of the Nigeria Youth Movement. They were teammates. What the referee Budilon did, Governor Budilon, was to now knock their heads together. Azikwe left the Nigerian Youth Movement and set up the NCNC and also the, I think it was the Igbo World Congress as well. Our Lord then sets up the um, Egbe Omo Dudua. So the rivalry now is beginning to take take shape and harden. Then if you look at the chronology, you will see that as NCNC led by Ezekiel goes into alliance with the MPC, the Northern People's Congress. And if you read our law's books, you, you see the narrative where he was trying to form an, an alliance with NCNC and Azikwe. But the puppeteers, the referee behind the scenes, was making sure that that offered hand would never be taken because it was their agenda from the get-go to keep the brothers as rivals. So the handshake across the Niger that was then offered then was never taken. And what then happened? That alliance government of NCNC and NPC. Go back to the chronology. You'll see that on the 29th of May, 1962, was when there was effectively a coup in the Western region, our lowest Western region administration. The clue is always the number 29, as Fatherland always explained. Again, we're not making this up. These are the dates on which these things happen. And when you start to understand the significance of the number 29 in our calendar, that is always the almost a signature of the agenda to knock the South Southern heads, Ibo and Yoruba in particular, to allow the British agenda, and I stress the British agenda of Northern domination of the political space. So that's state of emergency that was instigated in the Western region, the coup, 29th of May, 1962, led directly to our lower being jailed, sentenced, to a long term of imprisonment by that government, the MPC and NCNC administration. And more than that, the Western region was set on fire in a virtual civil war, which is the Operation Wetia, as the Alliance administration sought to emasculate what our law had been building in the Western region. That is the context in which we then have to answer the question, should our law have resigned? Another important part of the context is to understand the man himself. From my, I didn't have the fortune of meeting him, but from my, the insights that I've gained, one thing you say about, you can say about him um, with confidence is that it was always a man of his word. If he gave his word, he's going to keep his word. And he was induced to enter that administration. This is the war administration. Again, the dates is in the, is in the chronology. 
we're not privy to what was said to him. What promises? Maybe you'll become president of Nigeria. You're the one that can bring things together again after this war is over. Who knows? But always keep in mind those who are the ringmasters who are operating behind the actors that we are seeing. And so that's why, as I said earlier in my presentation, you see him defending the government policies, the starvation policy, as I said earlier, where the error is, is to assume or to suggest that he initiated that policy, that he was his policy. He was not, it was not his administration to initiate such a policy. But that policy decision having been make, made, he would go out, the man, if you knew the man, he would go out and he will defend it and, and explain it. And Ahuru did the same. He was Minister of Information. You see, I have a radar that always suspects what's going on. Who the real, what's really going on in the minds of the real manipulators. That these two were parked in these sensitive positions, Minister of Finance or Commissioner of Finance and Minister of Information. Because as I said in the book, Fabulous, there's always an eye on what happens next after the war to make sure that that rivalry will continue. And what better way to continue that rivalry than to put those two icons of Western region politics in those sensitive offices where they're going to have to speak and defend uh, those policies. Again, bear in mind that it was Gowan who released that law from his term of imprisonment. It was, it was always controversy, not so much controversy, confusion is the proper word, as to who released him. Was it Sojuku or was it um, Gowan? And of course you can see where that would have been going to because if it was Sojuku who released him, then it would, that ingratitude would then be the narrative. But it is a testimony to the greatness of Ujuku. He didn't have to say it. But in his book that I referenced earlier, titled Because I Am Involved, he said it was Gawan who released our law, not him. So you can begin to understand the sense of loyalty to the administration that our law might have had and question and not even might did have that would have meant that he didn't resign heaven knows with the benefit of hindsight people like me wish that he had but we will be judging him too harshly because we're using the benefit of hindsight and all that has flown from that. Yes, it would have been nice if it did, if he had. Then they wouldn't be able to pin that on our hero. But our hero was operating in that theater of war where charges of treason, and this is somebody who had been falsely jailed on a charge of treason and sentenced, as I said, for a very, very long time indeed. And then he would say, I'm resigning. I, I, I think it, it would have been difficult. Let me now look at the um, next question. Uh, Julie then said, a resignation is a very good way to distance oneself from bad decisions of, of an administration. It leaves no doubt, well, that's correct. 
but I, again, uh, I've put it in a context that we don't fully understand uh, the circumstances, and then we must allow and make allowance for what we do know. Uh, uh, that this is an administration, as he saw it, uh, that had destroyed the Western region. Um, you, that you can't um, wholly disallow um, sentiments in those circumstances. Chima said the brotherly rivalry which brought out the best of both tribes. Ah, that horrible word. Both nations. If there's one thing that Fatherland wants to get across, is that we are nations. If the Welsh at 1.2 million a nation, how can we be referring to our ethnic groups? None of which I suspect are smaller. When I say our ethnic groups, the 371, you'll probably struggle to find any one of them that is smaller than the Welsh. Or indeed, what about tiny Kosovo? Their population. What about Iceland? Population of 400,000 people. Now, okay, you say the Welsh may be bigger than us, but what of Iceland for Christ's sake? So let's get rid of this language which was deliberately planted in us, where we refer to our tribes. These are nations. Nigeria is a country. Yoruba nation, Igbo's a nation, etc., etc. And it, but it, carrying on, the brotherly rivalry which brought out the best of both nations in the past has not transcended to the current day. What can be done to reinvigorate our spirit of competition and drive out ethnic agenda? I think, as my brother Tim said, this is very much part of the process. When people understand why people, you have been, or sorry, when you understand why I'm looking at you in a particular way, you are then able to, if you feel the desire, you are able to respond to it and to change my perception of you. The reason we have not been able to get the best out of both is because of the behind the scenes actions that were still being taken to perpetuate the rivalry and to perpetuate more importantly the ignorance on which the rivalry was built and was thriving. Tackle the root of the problem and the root of the problem is lack of understanding. So we reinvigor reinvigorate our spirit of competition and we drive out the ethic agenda by exposing what Ojuku called the manufactured, in fact, let me not misquote him. He, the word that he used was the fabrication and installation of what I had earlier called East-West dichotomy. So to get to the root of this fabrication, because what people do and what has been happening is that people just indulge in what lawyers call hearsay. I heard it, I say, but I've not sought to really understand it. So it's only by shining the lights and tackling these difficult issues uh, that we would then make the progress. Ola Balogun said, I'm happy with the sentiments of the Yoruba and Igbo coming together. My concern is that there are several different groups in between. Are we not repeating history? by setting up this conference, supporting the paradigm that these are the most important nations 
in the old southern Nigeria? Well, I think my answer to Ola is this. We're not saying that these are the most important nations in the old southern Nigeria, or indeed in Nigeria. But we're saying that these are, by virtue of being the biggest, nations and that is a fact by virtue of being the biggest of the southern nigerian nations a rivalry between them those two impacts all other nations in southern nigeria and indeed in nigeria at large I think it's captured by the old saying that when two elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. So the other nations are a reality. They're part of that reality. But I don't think anybody can dispute that even right across the Nigeria space, the most poisoned relationship is that between the Igbos and the Yoruba. And the reason for that is what Ojuku said, fabricated. It'd be different if it was rooted in past attempts by the Igbos to conquer the Yoruba or the Yoruba to conquer the Igbos, but it's not. They had no wars. They didn't share a border. You've got the River Niger in between. You've got the Edo people in between. But the most poisonous rivalries are those that are rooted in lies. The ones that are manufactured. And that's why it needs to be confronted. And once that is addressed and tackled head on, then we have the prospects of speaking with one voice for the benefit of not just the other nations of Southern Nigeria, but the other nations of Nigeria to release the energies, the intellectual energies from throwing darts at each other, poisonous narratives, to more constructive dialogue. Open spaces, compliance consultants. Okay, uh, we now know who that is. Uh, do we need a Yoruba and Igbo Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Again, I think this is part of the process. It's probably not as, as large as that. But certainly we do need truth and reconciliation. And that comes from discussing the thorny issues. The 20 pound policy, which I gave those who joined us early enough, and I gave you the where it came from. And up until then, we'll be thinking that, oh, it was uh, the wicked uh, Yoruba man who dreamt it up to go and it's this 20 pound policy. When we see it was the allied powers who were using it in Nazi Germany. So where do you think, what do you think happened next? You don't need to be a genius to work it out. So doc, are you able to offer um, something on the truth? The question that was asked on the truth and reconciliation before we go back to um, Satim. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks Priscilla and Joe and everybody uh, listening. Um, it's safe to add um, just a small caveat. I don't know if you can hear me at all. Yes. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Uh, there, there are about 33 uh, truth commissions in the world and counting. Really? And uh, really, I would want to make just a friendly addition to what Dele said. Uh, and perhaps it should be um, a justice truth 
uh, and whatever else that you want in reparations commission that you want. Because one would imagine that uh, it, it things about that war in Biafra, uh, what preceded it, um, antecedents of it have not really been reckoned with. And even as you speak uh, right now, um, we, we, we should not be conflating a rivalry, which is akin to competition, with hatred and conflicts. Now, when you think about what is happening between the North and the South, you should really take examples of what's happening in the world, including down South in South Africa. Uh, the, the reality of it all is that that is literally required for people to find common ground. And there's quite a lot of common ground between the nationalities in the South of Nigeria, quite a lot. And uh, you can easily find common ground. And by the way, sports and soccer is one way of finding common ground because they unite a nation and nationalities. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, Joe, just to say that yes, my feeling is that you need to add justice because you see, uh, uh, Biafra was, it was born out of a yearning for, uh, you know, freedom and self-determination. And so justice is crucial to that aspect. It wasn't born out of what you can call hatred for the North or hatred amongst the nationalities out in the South. So that justice is crucial, if I may just say so for now. Um, obviously, uh, you don't take it um, uh, hook, line, and sinker like the South African one. You need to tailor it to suit the needs of the South uh, so that you can become one nation. Maybe for a change, that is possible. Thank you. That's very profound. Um reflection and uh, addition to the, uh, the debate. Thank you, Dr. Mouniti. Uh, that's uh, Ndubisi Sima. It's uh, Isima family. Um, in Igbo land, you probably say in those 70s period and early 80s, Isima family produced legendary footballers. Ndubisi Sima and his older brother, Okay Sima. All that point you see Odebami was saying about unity and the winning of the African Cup of Nations in 1980. Okay, Ndubisi's older brother was part of that squad that won that first game. And Ndubisi himself was also a professional footballer. Without much ado, Ndubisi have all sorts of stories. He can tell us stories about playing against his own brother, you know, uh, 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 being with his brother. Uh, exiting living rangers, his brother living rangers, joining um, the, the Yoruba Gogo Club, All Stars of Lagos. Uh, he has all sorts of stories, but most importantly, he's a professional footballer, retired as a professional footballer, and had his scholarship to to US and played all the way. I think he still holds the record in his, in his club in US, in his school club as the greatest goal scorer they have, an all-time goal scorer. So let me leave in the BC to fill the gaps for me. But it is a brother from day zero. I knew this guy from age 11, age 11, till day, to today. We are one of the few together. So he's, a, he's also a father in the BC. Take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. <laughs> it's so, I'm, I mean, you guys have been mesmerizing us for... for since the Fatherland came on board. So I just want to thank you, Timothy. They delay, delay you are family to all, to many people, to many Nigerians. I, I, I don't know if you know that now. And that's what I keep saying. You know, we appreciate you guys so much. And I just want to say, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm honored to be part of this uh, Fatherland group and to be invited into a forum like this is just unbelievable. And Shegun, Shegun has said it all, you know, uh, football is, uh, is a unifier. We, I was born in Kano, and we imagine born in Kano, went to school in uh, Holy Ghost, uh, went to school in Onisha, 
went to play in Joss, then went to play in Asabates, then end up in Julius Berger Lagos. So all this time, it's, it's about people. It's about Yorubas and the Igbos in Julius Berger. We had more Yoruba people in the team. The Yorubas came to me and said, send the VC, please, we want you to go and get Igbo boys from the East. We want to make Julius Berger a much stronger team. And I went to the East and I brought four Igbo boys. And we took Julius Berger to the top for the epic of Lagos uh, soccer. You know, so, I mean, there's so much to tell, but the most important thing I just want to say is that it, the, there's a dimension of uh, Yoruba Igbo relationship that many people don't know. We are very strong together, even in the junior Igbo's camp. There's a bond between Yorubas and Igbo's. And there's an all-star, I don't know if people know about it, there's an all-star football, uh, all-star football uh, group, uh, what do you call it, like a group. They have in Lagos, they have them in Abuja, they have them in, in Onisha, all over Nigeria, they have all-stars. And what all-stars means is where all S soccer players come together and we just have, you know, we, we have fun and we, we register to be part of these groups. Believe me, if you go to any All-Star uh, 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 group in Lagos, in Abuja, you cannot tell the difference between the Yorubas and the Igbos. We are one family, you know? So I even I remember, okay, was part of All-Star in Lagos, introduced me to Fashola, Fashola was running for election. It was the Igbos that spearheaded the election for governorship of Fashola. So there's so many ways that uh, Yorubas and Igbos, you know, work together. I mean, you can, I can't even begin to mention, uh, I can only say, but a few of them. But I, I tell you what this forum have done to, for me, and I think has done for so many people, is that you took us to university that like we've never seen before. You know, I, I'm, I'm collecting, you know, articles from Fatherland. And I'm, I'm, it's like I'm my collector of articles from Fatherland. The reason I'm doing that is that our children, my children, your children, and our children, this Fatherland group is going to be the, 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 the base for which they're going to relate with one another. You know, and I think what, Dele and all of you in this Fatherland have started is to educate us. Yes, Shegu, uh, Chief Odebami did uh, explain, you know, the need for sports and all the things that uh, sports can bring into relationship. But if you if you don't know where you're coming from, you know you will not know where you are, and you cannot know where you're going. So what Fatherland has given us is expose us to information like we never seen before. I see Chief Obafemi Awolowo differently now, like the narrative that I've had in the past. I see some of the information that distort our view of Yoruba people now differently, like I see now. I see, let me tell you, it's totally different what I'm seeing. I am put myself in the position of uh, Chief Awolowo and I said, wow, this man did the best he could at the time. And there's nothing wrong with this guy. This is a wonderful human being. But we have the narrative that he's a bad guy. He did all the bad things to Igbo people. Please keep up the good work. We are learning. We are growing. Our children are benefiting from the information that you are sharing in this group. And I appreciate it so much. You know, one thing is to be a sports lover. But another thing is to love people, you know, the, that's the most important thing. I, I was sharing with Timothy this, this morning, I said, listen, you are nothing if you don't make a difference in other people's life. I don't care how much money you have or whatever you have. The key is what, can, what difference do you bring to the community? What difference do you bring to individual lives? And that's where Odebami, Odebami is a wonderful human being. He has been on the forefront of what we are doing in Fatherland today, except he has never had the platform like we have. This is an international platform. We, you are reaching people from all over the world. And they, that's what makes the difference. So I thank you guys so much. I will just 
I, I listened to the chair, you know, I listened to uh, Dele, I listened to Timothy before I rushed to airport to, to, to pick up somebody before I came back, you know. But one thing that the, the, the chair pointed out that I love so much, he said that, you know, is now that, we, you know, we own our own language that we use, you know, to, to, to describe ourselves. So we own the language that we use to describe ourselves, not somebody else, which is what they've been feeding us in Nigeria, you know. But now, you, this platform, Fatherland, has given us, you know, a new perspective for which we can own ourselves and we can pass down to our children. I'm telling my children different things about Awolowo right now. I'm talking about, you know, politics to be seen in Nigeria, seen differently from what I was taught or what I believed, you know? So I just want to say, please, thank you guys so much. Sports has been very, very pivotal to where we are today, many of us, you know, if not for sport. In the junior ghost camp, it was wonderful with the Yoruba team. As a matter of fact, when I arrived in the United States on scholarship, the first soccer player that I brought to America was a Yoruba, uh, Adeleke. You know, I, if I had so many Yubos that I bet Adeleke was somebody I needed to be in my team because we can make a difference together. So the first person that I brought to the United States from Nigeria was Adeleke. And uh, I mean, and so forth and so on. We have done so many things. Right here in South Africa, I own a travel agency. My main customers are Yorubas. They patronize me. They go to Nigeria. They communicate with me from Nigeria. We have a wonderful relationship with Yorubas here. And I love them and they love me. You know, the key for uh, the, the relationship between Igbo and Yoruba is on the individual, how you make yourself. Right now, because of what you guys have made of yourself, people gravitate towards you. I, if I see uh, 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 Dele today, I'm gonna, hug, I'm gonna hug him and thank him. I'm gonna love him so much, <laughs> you know? Because of what he stood for, what he's been fighting for, what is, he can see, that he is doing this thing for our children, for our country to be a better place, for, for us to have a better future. And there's nothing else. And you can see so much sacrifice that has been made by so many, every one of you. So we thank you, we appreciate you, we love you, and we continue to be part of this group and support it. I'm encouraging many people to join because this is where you get real information, not partial information or fake news or anything. Every information, do you get in fatherland is something that you can dissect and take so much from there's so much substance so thank you all and i appreciate you i thank you timothy is a family this one is my brother from another mother we started together we grew up together we had nothing together we have something together we've been together forever and we continue to be together guys love you appreciate you <laughs> Wow, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. So let me let me come back to you, Sir Tim, to you know conclude on that. That that was lovely. Uh, it's epic. It's epic. When um you know you, you don't even know. I mean, we actually decided to form a, a WhatsApp group, but no more than three or four of us, and yeah. forever. No, but no more people coming in, nobody going. We're about three of us that call ourselves Omonne. Yeah, Simple, yeah, yeah. and we kept it for so NBC is extraordinary. You can't, it's just overwhelmed. But I, I love my brother there, you know. So, um, just back into this, uh, I mean, this is we now taking there's a from my take home message and all these things, we've taken a lot. It shows me the fatherland have moved centuries forward, con considering when this decision to begin to celebrate uh, every. 15th of January to make it a particular focus period uh, in January in particular on Ibo-Yoruba relationship. I love the fact that if you look at where we're coming from, where we are now, we hit the nail at the head. And I think every message everybody's saying in the BC, Shegun, uh, Okala, um, all the people and the questions here, everybody's gravitating towards. Uh, there is hope. Everybody's looking for people to trust and Fatherland is gaining that trust, and we, our job is to manage the trust people are 
and down onto us. And with the level of knowledge, we'll do that. And I'll leave the closing speech and uh, the point other things for my brother Dele, because I know he will have, a, you know, one or two things <laughs> as usual to leave us with their take home messages. Over to you, my brother. Thank Dele. you. Thank you so much, that Tim. That's, that's kind. Thank you very much, uh, Priscilla. Uh, thank you, uh, Indivisi. Uh, thank you, the, uh, uh, the legends, uh, Chief uh, Emmanuel Kala and uh, Chief Shegun Odegbami. I'll thank you again later, uh, but let me go uh, to the questions uh, that we put on hold uh, while we uh, heard your presentations, uh, and I did promise to deal with them. Because here in Fatherland, we do not run away from issues. However challenging, however difficult, we confront them. Because when they say it is the truth that will set you free, you won't gain freedom from running away from issues. You've got to address them head on. So, uh, Dr. Akin Fakonda uh, asked the question. He said, a quest for who can displace each other in being in bed with the Fulani hegemonists seems to be the prime basis of our problem. Is the solution not for the Igbos and the Yorubas to pursue nationhood and achieve it simultaneously? I believe as neighbors, there will be mutual respect. My explanation and my response is this. It is correct that by virtue of that grand conspiracy, the British conspiracy to knock the heads of the Igbos and the Yorubas together in particular, in order to allow their agenda, and I always stress, it was their agenda. It wasn't the Fulani agenda or the Hausa agenda. It was the British agenda for the Fulani to dominate this space, the political space. And it was in the pursuit of that agenda that they, on April Fool's Day, separated what had been one Southern Nigeria. And with a consequence, that thereafter we had a political situation where the North would dance with the East. And then when that dance is over and the music stops, they'll turn around and dance with the West. And we can see that still at play even now, even in the current dispensation. When the dance with Tinubu and his people, and now, who are we going to dance with again? And yes, uh, the solution is the ending of this misunderstanding and rivalry between the Ibos and the Yoruba, such that we can release the potential of both nations. And in that spirit of competition, that we heard between Enugu Rangers and IICC shooting stars, between the East and the West, bringing their first 11, rubbing off against each other in that spirit of constructive competition, respecting each other. And then at the end of the match, we heard it, going back to each other's homes and sharing food, drink, and uh, all the joys of uh, human social relationships. This is truly the way forward. So the contest needs to change. It needs to change from being the dance part the junior partner in a relationship with the North. It needs to change too, finding our feet again, our pride again, each of our nations, such that it will not be dancing turn by turn, but everybody will be dancing, not just the Igbos and not just the Yorubas, the house will be dancing, the Fulani will be dancing. 
That is the fatherland message, to release the nations in order to release their potential. Uh, Julie said, um, Julie Obiami said, it is true that the British knocked our heads together, but we are complicit in our own abuse because we do not uphold the truth. But that is only correct in respect of those who know the truth. What about the vast majority who are ignorant and innocently so of the true story? Fatherland's mission has been to bring the light onto the dark spaces, to educate, to inform, to empower with knowledge of the true facts and the true story of what really happened. It is only once you've invested people with the knowledge that they need to free themselves that we can justly condemn them if they then choose to remain in bondage after you've equipped them with the knowledge. But that's education task, which has been neglected by the, those who are responsible for the education policy, and they've done it deliberately. Is Fatherland's role and purpose to free that up. Atkins uh, came back with a comment on the 20 pound issue. Uh, I thought it was on record that I will always achieve the balanced budget at the end of the war. Suppose our Igbo brethren were to be granted 1,000 or 10,000 each. Is there any thought about where the money uh, was to come from? Should our law have just printed paper as currency and share it out? Any thoughts about the hyperinflation consequences? Is it being suggested that Aulo had the money in bullion vans and out of hatred just refused to dole it out to the Ebos? Well, I guess that's uh, <clears throat> those are the issues that you've tabled, uh, not really inviting me to answer because I've explained the circumstances in which Aulo uh, was operating. And as we heard from our brother, uh, Undubusi, that with that information, it, they are able to look at these issues differently. And it is in the, in, in the light of truth and, and knowledge uh, that we'll be able to answer all of those questions. Um, Julie's, uh, my sister-in-law, now uh, comment has, has already been discussed by Priscilla. Uh, we then had um, Yemi, Open Spaces Compliance Consultants. How does Chief Adigami's clarion call that sports can create a one Nigeria chime with fatherland's position of an orange union of Nigeria? Very good question. And I'm grateful for the opportunity <clears throat> to explain the fatherland proposal for the orange union for Nigeria, which when you hear it, you understand how it fits exactly with what Chief Odegami was saying. The Orange Union speaks to the fact that when you peel the skin of the orange, you have the segments of the orange sitting comfortably together and to make it together, making that whole. Using the football analogy, when you pull those 11 players together, they're different sizes. They're not all the same size. They're not all the same speed, not all the same strength or the attributes. But a great manager brings that first 11 together in all their varieties. He doesn't want uniformity because that's not gonna get him the victory if they all play the same way. It is the bringing together and the recognizing and coming to terms with those differences, the reality of difference, that you then get that wholesome project, product. That is the orange union. Peel the skin of the orange. You'll see Yoruba nation sitting next to the Igbo nation, the Ijo nation, the Hausa nation, the Fulani nation the Tiv Nation, they will all be like that first 11 of that team, dream team. And the skin of the orange is Nigeria. 
But within that skin, there will be constructive, healthy rivalry, competition between these segments of the orange. And Chief Odegbami let us in to that reality. You know when he did that? Think back to what he said about the origins of Enigma Rangers and how he and his colleagues perceived Enugu Rangers. He said this was not just a football team. They played football. He said this was a movement. This was an Igbo movement. And that, and they, they saw how they were performing. Winning excellence. When the Igbo nation found expression through the Enugu Rangers football club. And what did it induce? Not jealousy, not petty jealousy, but the spirit of competition. That we too are going to put our first 11 together. He said it. So shooting stars became that Yoruba first 11 to compete constructively with eyes with uh, Enugu Rangers. So that is the Orange Union in action, releasing trapped potential in the spirit of healthy competition, not pretending that we are one, but embracing that reality and the diversity. It's unfortunate that we didn't get a chance to <clears throat> ask Chief the question that I, I had for him and uh, Chief O'Kala, which is this. Under the current structure that we have, where we have super eagles, and there's only space for 11 players. Leaving aside the rest of the squad. And then thinking back to that competition between shooting stars and Enugu Rangers. Ibo first 11, Yoruba first 11. Almost like the home nations tournament that the British used to have. Where... Scotland will play Wales and Wales will play Ireland and Ireland will play England, each producing their first 11. And think about what we're losing right now, where this island called Britain, when it comes to the World Cup, they're able to field a Welsh team, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland team, South Republic team, uh, Scottish team, and an English team out of their small relative population. And we have got all our eggs in that one basket. Think if there was a, in the Orange Union where we will have 371 ethnic groups and each will produce their first 11 football. And then when it comes to putting the Nigerian football team together, it will be there for us all to see. We will have seen these players in the tournaments. So you see how potential is being trapped by the current arrangement where we refuse to recognize the reality of our differences and embrace it such that it can be unleashed in healthy competition. Every street in Nigeria, every community can produce a team of 11. How much more every ethnic group? Just think what we're losing, the potential that we're wasting, those ones who cannot be seen. So, Chief Odigbami's comments speak directly to the the promise of the Union of the Orange. 
when Enigo Rangers and all Ibo First Eleven will play ISCC shooting stars and all Yoruba First Eleven. May the best man win. And then after the match, they get together at the social level. And more importantly, when Nigeria now needs to face outwards, they come together under the Nigerian jersey of the Super Eagles, the skin of that orange. So I hope, uh, Yemi, that uh, explains uh, the reconciliation uh, sufficiently clearly. Reviews. You guys were fantastic equally. Your presentations. The chair captured the essence of the dialogue. Dealey was subtle and ingenious as always. I must confess your presentation raised the adrenaline of the dialogue the Fatherland team deserve the best truly. I love every one of them. They sacrifice so much for the healing and restoration of Nigeria. For in Nigeria every citizen will have a sense of belonging and willing to contribute their quota for her growth and development. You can feel the depth of the determination and resilience of Dili and the rest of the team for a free and fair Nigeria. Fantastic dialogue. My regards to all. From Dubi's I Isima, the 22nd of January, 2022. Hi everyone, the Fatherland Group is a global network of Nigerians armed with a deep understanding of our past, present and our future. Please like, follow, share our YouTube channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Subscription on YouTube is actually free, so please do that and turn on your notifications. That way you'll be the first to know whenever we share new content. To learn more, please log on to the fatherlandgroup.org fatherlandgroup.org. Thank you.